This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. Uh, I'm Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, with Douglas Mock, who is a an emeritus professor in the Department of Zoology at the University of Oklahoma. And he's also the author of a number of books, um, this one right here, which is called uh, More Than Kin and Less Than Kind. And he's also the author of another book called The Evolution of Sibling Rivalry. Uh, welcome, Doug. Thank you. Nice to be here. So in, in economics, we, we have this, uh, well, I don't know whether it's an economics term, but that's a term I use all the time, which is uh, this term, uh, you know, frenemies. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a unique word in the English language. I've tried to find uh, another language that has a, a similar word, and I have yet to find a, a language which, which has this, this term. But the reason why I find it so useful in, in economics and business strategy is because it highlights the, the notion that, you know, we're as, as creatures or as businesses, as individuals, we're constantly interacting with others, some of whom our interests are aligned with and some of whom our interests are in conflict with. But most of the time, it's, it's a little bit of, of, of both. And uh, your work really highlights how this dual uh, notion of conflict and cooperation extends even into the, the family right? The family unit. Uh, and so a lot of people think that, you know, families are units where everyone's in alignment, <laughs> but, but every day our interactions with our family members um, kind of highlight that this is not always the case. So um, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how this, this idea has grown in acceptance in the world of, of biology um, you know, my, my, when I teach, when I used to teach biology, I would spend a lot of time on, um, on Hamilton's rule and, and Hamilton's rule really is always talked about as the, um, theoretical backbone for, um, cooperation, right. And how, uh, you know, cooperation emerges in a world where we wouldn't expect there to be cooperation, right. Through, through kin selection, but you know, that's, that's the half full side of, of Hamilton's rule, right? There's the half empty side of Hamilton's rule, which is that, exactly. you know, we're, we're not fully related to our, our uh, family members. So, so maybe just tell us uh, what, 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 you know, when you started in this field, what was the, the, the state of um, thinking about family dynamics and, and how has it changed over the years? Well, Hamilton's rule, of course, was the, the huge breakthrough but Hamilton's rule defines the boundary conditions for altruism, and it's an inequality. So um, in hindsight, I can see that my only insight there was to ask what happens when the inequality is not satisfied, mm -hmm. in which case the default is selfishness or looking out for self-interest. And so the 20 odd years that I spent studying fatal sibling competition in birds was pretty much centered around a situation where it was quite evident that the closest of genetic relatives were uh, executing each other. <clears throat> and this had repercussions for the inclusive fitness, Hamilton's term, uh, for all other members of the family and that the dynamics were likely to be a whole lot more complicated. But at the very beginning, when I first started telling people that the birds were sublicidal, I had um, people telling me, uh, oh, well, they must be um, half-siblings. They must be uh, unrelated eggs that got dumped into the nest. Mm -hmm. They must be on and on and on because of the power of Hamilton's insight as to how altruism could evolve through natural selection had seduced everybody into uh, seeing uh, that as the complete answer to the, to the question, and it obviously was not. Right, and so in economics, we we, we generally uh, define economics as the um, science of scarcity, right? And um, exactly. you know, anytime yeah. we think there's scarcity, uh, you know, that's when economics raise their hand and say, okay, you know, we, we have something to say about this. And I think you know your work is really all about uh, scarcity, scarcity Absolutely. within the, yeah. the the family unit. And and actually, it's I guess it's it's a little bit um, more specific because you're focused on what we might call the the, the nursery, right? And uh, broadly defined. So could you, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what is the domain of, of the nursery 
And, um, and you, even though your work is in birds, you, you, you talk about, you know, plants, you, you talk about, um, you know, you reference humans, you try not to, but you can't help it. <laughs> there's all these human metaphors about, you know, grocery shopping and family budget and, and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, siblicidal, uh, you know, royalty throughout history. That's right. Uh, and here, in fact, here comes a mammal now. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, it is about scarcity. It's about critically limited resources. <clears throat> and there's a good reason as to why many of the uh, evolutionary optimality models are, have been stolen from economics. I mean, that's uh, where humans are worrying about wealth. They, they are motivated to think hard and, and clearly and to test some of the ideas uh, with the marketplace. Uh, evolutionary biology, John Maynard Smith in particular, uh, saw that connection and saw that, oh, uh, game theory in particular was really well suited to evolutionary biology and in some ways better than money because it's pretty clear that what's being maximized long term is inclusive fitness in, in evolutionary biology. So is it mating success, breeding success, parental success, <laughs> survival and production of children and, and grandchildren? So, um, well, I mean, what's great, we, what's great about that is that, you know, biology offers testable hypotheses, whereas, yeah. you know, economics, economics at the yeah. end of the day doesn't, right? Because we, the, you know, we, we, we hypothesize that there's this, you know, people maximizing utility all the time, but, but utility is, who knows what that is, right? I mean, you can get utility from killing yourself, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> there's no way to actually test our, our, our theories, but in biology, like we, we know what the objective function is, right? I mean, it's, that's right. And, that's right. and so, and so it, it, we're, we're kind of jealous. We're kind of envious of. <laughs> well, I mean, well, but you guys started it first. I mean, you were, uh, the economics was really where people, people have been a lot worried about money and resources a lot longer than they've been worried about family dynamics in birds uh, and, and mammals and so forth. So, <clears throat> yeah, so I think, I think it, was a, it was a rather obvious, but it is a, it is a really fortuitous fit for us. And uh, a lot of the models were really nicely developed uh, already and uh, famously so. And so they've just been hijacked, pirated, modified, used as needed. And yeah, then the fun part, um, as far as I'm concerned, is trying to use the theoretical constructs that started with economics and then were adapted to evolutionary biology and trying to use those with real world systems where you can test them and you can find out things about them. But, you know, in biology as in economics, uh, people fall in love with hypotheses and they get a sexy idea into their heads and they go berserk, uh, uh, desperately trying to make the data fit the model. Uh, and that's sort of a pet peeve of mine that's been bothering me for a very long time. Uh, I, was, I was still a graduate student when I realized that um, not all biologists, even famous ones, were out there literally trying to test hypotheses. They were playing favorites, sort of rooting for the ones that, that had the most glamour and um, willing to overlook the data that didn't fit. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of a shocking moment for me. Uh, the other shocking moment is mentioned in the book was the first time I was out watching baby egrets uh, fighting with each other and realized that the parents weren't going to stop the fights. Mm -hmm. That was a, a, an astonishing moment for me where I thought, oh, there's a lot more going on here than, than is obvious. And it, you know, it just takes, a lot of time thinking and sort of nagging away at a problem like that. Well, well, let's go back to that old idea, right? So the idea that you um, originally held, which was common wisdom among biologists, was that since all of the offspring of a mother, let's say, are equally related to the mother, that the mother would have um, an interest, an equal interest in kind of promoting the lives of each of their offspring. And so if one, one child was attacking the other, you know, they would have an interest in, in coming in and, and kind of, you, you know, maintaining peace. And I love how in the book you said that this, you wanted this to be true because of your own childhood when you were, I think, a fourth child and, and, uh, fourth, fourth boy. 
Yeah. Was, yeah, I have three older brothers. Yeah. So and the dumbest so, hierarchy. And so you, yeah. you were not presumably tossed out of the nest and left to, to fend for yourself. And, and this was uh, presumably because of your mother's uh, protection of you as the, as the runt of there the litter? There was a certain amount of screening. Yeah, that went, that went on. And they, you know, my brothers had their chance and they, uh, uh, they, they couldn't, couldn't put me out permanently. I don't think they were seriously trying to, but um, yeah, it, it did sort of resonate. And so tell us, so this, this idea was just, was, was sort of a, um, uh, an orthodoxy at, at, at the time. There were, there were two threads. I think if I look back, um, I was an undergraduate in the late 1960s and the, uh, work of David Lack, um, on what was coming to be called brood reduction, uh, that, that parent birds create more offspring than they necessarily raise. And so one member of the brood sometimes died. <clears throat> and Lack reasoned in the, gosh, in the 1940s, he reasoned that this might be, um, this might be in the parents' interests, mm -hmm. that the parents, the parents were really overproducing, not knowing what the family budget was going to be, not knowing what the ecological realities would unfold and so the family budget was unknown and that, that parents often uh, erred on the side of optimism and produced mm -hmm. one or two more eggs into the nest than was the average um, carrying capacity of the family budget. And so he had pointed this out in the 40s, but then, you know, uh, almost 20 years later when Hamilton's rule came along uh, in evolutionary biology, people were going back and grabbing that that insight from ecologist David Lack, they were running off into evolution of social behavior and thinking about how altruism can evolve, which is very exciting. Uh, so I think what I did, and several of us working at the same time, realized was that Lack was onto an important thing and that this addressed this, the glass half empty, uh, glass half empty side of the, of the uh, family size dynamic. But parents, parents uh, in birds, I'll just use egrets because the timing is familiar with me, but the parents have to lay a finite number, an integer number of eggs. You can't lay three and a half eggs uh, to, to hedge your bets. You have to go ahead and, and commit yourself to four and four may be more than, than the food base is actually going to support. Mm -hmm. And so there may have to be a, a secondary correction in family size down the line. Well, it took me a couple of years of pondering all of this, sort of to realize that, uh, really to realize that I, I'd expected that the parents would start interfering with these sibling fights when the parents were having a, when the food was super abundant. Mm -hmm. And after a couple of years of waiting for that to happen and collecting data and sort of trying to understand the system descriptively, it suddenly dawned on me that some parents in this colony of thousands of birds, some parents were having a good food year every year because they were better at hunting. And none of the parents were interfering with the fights. And at that point, the light sort of switched on and I thought, oh my golly, um, this, is, this is something that the parents are not necessarily opposing the, the trashing of one of the offspring. And then from there, it was a pretty short jump to realize that the parents had already stacked the deck against the youngest, the youngest offspring. Birds lay eggs no more often than one per day. And so if one egg is laid on Monday and the second egg, I'll call them A and B, is laid on Tuesday, and the third egg, C, is laid on uh, Wednesday or Thursday, as nutrients are amassed by the by the mother to produce eggs. Uh, parents can either hatch all of them at the same time three week, four weeks later by waiting until the last egg is laid and then starting the embryos into embryological development at the same time by incubating at the same time. Or in many species, they start after the first egg is laid and give it a head start. And then B gets a head start over C. So, and so, so, they, so in terms start. of birth, so birth order is something that the, the, um, the, the mother egg or the parent eggs can control. But you also mentioned that the eggs can kind of talk to each other, like while they're still 
you know, while they're still eggs, right? Well, let me, let me, first of all, it's not mother eggs. These are, they, the, the mother's already hatched. She's full grown, uh, but the right. two parent birds do the incubating and they are in control of when embryological development starts. And so they, um, and I did spend a couple of years um, working with my wife, Trish Swagmeyer, trying to look at the inter-egg communications going on before hatching among the babies. But getting back to the simple model of parents and eggs in the nest, and parents give a head start to the A over B and B over C. So C hatches out a couple, three days after A has already hatched. A is out and is on solid food and is starting to develop, is not limited by the nutrients in the yolk, but is able to um, start taking on solid food and is able to, is able to grow beyond the confines of the rigid uh, eggshell. And so the first two chicks are a couple, three days bigger than the, than the C, A, A, C chick by the time it hatches. And so there's, a, there's an asymmetry that translates into size, A, age, and motor skill uh, differences. And the older, bigger, and more coordinated babies uh, are in position to dominate the younger one if they choose to do so. So that's, and that part where I realized that the parents were co-conspirators, as it were, um, working um, uh, or, or completely laissez-faire and letting the uh, selfish tendencies of the senior siblings lead to whatever domination and physical abuse might happen uh, on, the, on the designated victim, the runt. And so that was, the, that was sort of the breakthrough moment of where suddenly all the, the picture shifted like a kaleidoscope, but it was a beautiful picture once I got it in focus and started working with that and thinking about the repercussions of it. What happens if the parents didn't do that? What would the sibling dynamics be like if all the babies were equal? You know, what would happen if their hormones uh, were being manipulated inside the eggs in some way, if it, something that the mother would have uh, metabolic control over? And just a whole host of, of problems and things. And for that matter, what was it about beating up the younger sibling that made it um, worth the effort uh, for the senior siblings? What, what did they gain from doing that? And the answer is priority access to food. And when the food is limiting, that can be super important. So Lack's um, model sounds an awful lot like something we would recognize in, say, operations research, right? I mean, if you have un uncertain supply or uncertain demand, then, you know, you have to trade off having too much versus yeah. versus too little, right? I mean, it, it's, it should be something, it seems very, very familiar to us in, in, in business operations, you know, inventory management and, and, and so forth. Right. Yeah. But this was something that in the 1940s, I mean, Lamont Cole had just invented the term life history mm -hmm. to apply to things that animals and plants do that have evolutionary consequences that are not behavior. So things like how big of an egg should I produce? Uh, what kind of nutrient packing should I do? Should I play with the, the hormone chemistry inside the the egg yolk uh, uh, in advance. All of these things are possible things that aren't really behavior in the sense of motor patterns, but they are things that have the strategic consequences for the players in the dynamic. And that's, um, that's, that, that, had, that was his first paper on that came out in 1945. And three years later, David Lack was explaining essentially overproduction and uh, the interplay between clutch size and the behavioral dynamic of when you start incubation. And he was trying to understand why, why they have asynchronous hatching. Those were in, in Swift's nesting in the Oxford uh, bell tower. Uh, and he was starting to tinker around with that and think about it a bit, but yeah, no, it, it's, it's not really a novel. It's not really a novel concept from economics and from business. But it was very novel at the time in ecology, evolution, and animal behavior. Well, you mentioned that, you know, your insurance hypothesis, right? The mm -hmm. idea that, you know, animals with these would systematically kind of over, overproduce. 
um, mm-hmm. and then kind of kind of call the the flock, um, unless of course there was some kind of accident uh, that would require you know preserving the the QB three so to speak right the the third string uh, uh, offspring. You said that this this idea um, when it was introduced, uh, it was much better understood by kind of non-biologists than biologists initially, or it, it, it sort of made sense. Um, That's right. So, so why do you suppose that is? Because, um, I mean, I certainly think it's, it sounds, it sounds like, oh yeah, okay, this makes sense. You know, preserve oh. optionality, you know, make sure okay. you have a, a backup quarterback, <laughs> you know, in case the first yep. one goes yeah. down. But needless to say at University of Oklahoma, using quarterbacks was a perfectly good pedagogical <laughs> right. technique. I figured. Uh, yeah because of linebackers as the selection pressure against quarterbacks. Um, no, well, the reason, of course, was that at the time in the 1940s, evolutionary biology was very confused about how natural selection works. Mm-hmm. And in particular, it was widely believed and had not been coming to focus yet. It was widely believed that things evolve for the good of the species, mm-hmm. of the whole species. And... Um, that really didn't come under, into question until the early 1960s. So while I was in high school and I was completely oblivious of all that, but um, the leading thinkers in evolutionary biology started realizing that it's uh, much more parsimonious to think of evolution operating at the level of the individual. And then Richard Dawkins and others, uh, Dawkins popularized the the notion that that Hamilton and George Williams and others uh, had that no selection is really operating at the level of the of the gene or of the allele, technically. But um, during the from the 40s and through the 50s and you know well into my college years, uh, this hadn't gotten people hadn't gotten clear on this yet, and they thought that things evolved for the good of the whole species. So wasting offspring made no sense from the point of view of the whole species didn't make a whole lot of sense from the point of view of the parents interests but um at least we were on the right track at that point and you could start to rephrase the questions uh, uh in a, a more productive way now there are some other theories out there right that you mentioned um there's one that's just the biological wastage um theory mm-hmm. right which is that well you know sometimes there's just you know, stuff that doesn't make sense, right? And and then uh, there's there's the um, I think it was called the the mobile uh, mobile larder uh, theory, right? Yeah, which, yeah. Which I guess only works when you actually eat the um, the offspring. Um, That's true. But then you have folks like Stephen Jay Gould who would be who are very critical of a lot of evolutionary biologists, saying that you know this is just a bunch of just so stories, and you can That's conjure right. up any old just so story and and propagate it. Um, and I think your main argument is that you can actually test these theories and the way you yeah. test them is with a variety of interventions and, and, and manipulations, right? So, so evolutionary biology is often thought of as a theoretical discipline, but I think you argue that it's, it's a very, it's an empirical discipline and that, you know, all of these theories are testable. So how do you, how do you go about testing these, these things and how do you, um, address these accusations of say, just so stories. Okay. Well, that's, that's a, there's a broad issue. Um, first, let me tell, let me tell an an anecdote. Uh, Gould and Lewinton were attacking sociobiology, which, uh, Ed Wilson had been making a huge splash over in the mid 1970s. So the selfish gene was coming out, um, from Richard Dawkins and a sociobiology book had just come out from Ed Wilson and Gould and Lewington, Lewington were having at them. And I think we're leveling some perfectly legitimate uh, charges that too many people were saying, oh, this is a lovely theory, it must be true. It deserves to be true, that sort of thing. So there was an active, also there were, there were definite um, echoes of the Third Reich being uh, seen or imagined into biological determinism. And that's a big part of their motivation and their, their concern about all of this. So there was a, a cadre of, of people who were very, very hostile to biological determinism and by extension to sociobiology. And at one point, um, my PhD alma mater, University of Minnesota, 
invited me to come back. They were de uh, dedicating the new College of Biological Sciences at Minnesota, and they wanted to bring back two of their recent graduates. We were basically being brought in to serve as a warm-up band. Uh, the headliner was Francis Crick. Mm -hmm. And Francis Crick had just published a paper called Selfish DNA. And so the the local um, Gould Lewinton fans, the, a group called Science for the People, they were um, coming to the talks uh, picketing, essentially, and there to make trouble. Well, I gave a talk. I gave a talk. It was, yeah, it was about two years into the study of suicide. I had lots of anecdotal stuff and a, a few data and some things to talk about. And these guys were, were laying for me. And at one point, I finished my talk and I asked if there were any questions. Hand raised it. And it was a, a professor from the Department of Genetics at Minnesota. And his question to me was, have you done the behavior genetics experiments yet to show that any of the behaviors you've been talking about have a heritable basis? Yeah, have you done that with great egrets? And I said, certainly not. Uh, great egrets have extremely slow life, life cycles, would be terrible experimental animals, and uh, no, not done nothing with that. At which point he said, well, then it's clear that you know nothing about genetics and you're wasting our time by getting up and talking about all of these just so stories. Well, I wasn't quite sure what to do. I was, you know, a second year professor and I'd never been confronted this way before, but on the front row of the uh, audience, Francis Crick raised his hand. So I think when in doubt, call on the Nobel laureate, you know, and he stood up and he said, well, I understand quite a bit about genetics and what he says makes perfectly good sense to me. Okay. So I just said, um, does anyone else have genetics questions while Dr. Crick is on his feet <laughs> and got through the scene? But, um, no, there was real hostility. And I well, think that actually seems like a remarkably civil story story. <laughs> yes. You know, no, no, one, no one dumped or, water no, on you. Nobody, uh, no, no you know, water. That's right. No, not even a Gatorade bath. So right. yeah, no, it was, it was, it was pretty civil and things got nice uh, from that point forward. But, um, now I forgot what the second question, oh, how to test these things. Um, well, I, th I see, I see science at its best as a, uh, two parallel ladders, basically, uh, a, th a theory ladder and an empiricism, um, empiricism ladder. And sometimes people try to cross from one ladder to the other back and forth. But for the most part, these are two separate sub subcultures within science. And I think we empiricists do our best if we are constantly looking over to see what the empiricists are doing and vice versa. All too often, the empiricists ignore completely what the literature actually has to say about what animals do. And the uh, empiricists um, ignore completely what the theoreticians are doing. Mm -hmm. But um, it occurred to me pretty early on, I spent my first sabbatical at the University of Liverpool trying to learn something about game theory with Jeff Parker. And um, he was, uh, it was just really interesting to see the ways in which modeling using mathematics could help you clean up your thinking and make you identify your assumptions and a whole bunch of things that otherwise could lead you into these um, sort of endless spirals of fantasy and conjecture. So um, that the sort of became the way that I, I, you know, I never became a theoretician, but I worked with Jeff for, for many, many years. And uh, so he was doing the math and I was doing the field work. And we wrote that first book, Evolution of Sibling Rivalry Together, where all of the, the, the really intimidating equations are from Jeff's contributions. I, I sometimes say that my job was uh, to write the natural history part of it, talk about egrets and herons quite a bit, and to uh, translate Jeff into English, which is uh, a sort of insider joke because he is, of course, British. Yes. But um, he was speaking, his, his chapters, he'd send me a chapter that was 200 pages long of equations. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, no, we can't, we, can't, we can't have a chapter that long that's nothing but equations. 
uh, the book will be thrown violently against the wall, uh, and the publisher won't hand. Anyway, it just it was it was fun to work with him for these reasons. But that's the two ladders. Uh, Jeff and I were were on uh, different uh, different priorities. But he had done empirical work, and I was determined to learn more about uh, theoretical work. And that uh, that was very fruitful, uh, a fruitful uh, collaboration. Well, you talk about the difference between behavioral ecology and evolutionary ecology, and you say that, you know, one is concerned with um, uh, kind of actions or a behavior taken by <laughs> an animal, and the other is is about kind of non-behavior. I mean, I think I tend to think of them both as, as really involving choices, right? And, you know, the choice of how many offspring to have, the choice of, you know, when to have the offspring or, you know, how big the offspring is or how much investment is made. I mean, is, is, does it really make sense to keep these disciplines separate? How, how do no. biologists think about them? Do, do biologists actually think of these as different no. disciplines or do they think of this as, you know, one big, um, integrated, uh, you know, set of tools. Historically, I think, uh, they had to come in somewhat separately, but, you know, animal behavior wasn't really a field when, I mean, there were people working on behavior of animals, but it, uh, it was sort of getting the ethology, classical ethology was getting its legs under it in the forties and fifties, uh, in the post-war years. And uh, uh, people like Carl von Frisch and Nico Tinberg and, and Conrad Lorenz were inventing the field they called ethology. And then uh, uh, Lamont Cole and others were developing life history theory, which was the other track. And no, I think uh, in the, in the uh, 1970s, certainly no, no later than the 1970s, uh, these two became fused inexorably, and they have been uh, intimately related ever since. But I used to teach the my meat and potatoes course that I taught at University of Oklahoma was called Animal Behavior. Mm -hmm. So I had, when if I wanted to talk about life history theory, which I did, I would say, okay, now we're going to step out of capital B behavior, and we're going to talk about you know essentially everything else that influences uh, natural selection. Because this is really, of course, about natural selection. Mm -hmm. uh, and behavior is just a subset of the phenotypes that I wanted to talk about and wanted to teach them about. So you blur that, blur that uh, from that point. And the, I think the, the sociobiology uh, in the 1970s came to be so aligned with questions of trying to interpret, and I would say overinterpret human behavior, mm -hmm. it moved prematurely into explaining everything about our most marvelous selves um, to our own vanity. And so it made itself sort of vulnerable to the people who didn't want there to be a whole lot of crossover into thinking about humans. And the, the British uh, uh, contingent in our field uh, essentially hijacked it and renamed the field behavioral ecology, mm -hmm. which included life history theory and behavior and everything above and just spent very little time talking about um talking about humans well i remember when i used to go to the animal behavior society conferences the the first question anybody would ask is like you know what what's your animal and and i would always say you know people and they're like yeah. what are you doing yeah. here you don't you don't belong <laughs> here you get, you know, you're at the wrong <laughs> conference yeah right. exactly yeah so, um, so let's dig deep into uh, this, you know, infanticide, uh, or um, actually infanticide is a separate question. And I think, it, you know, it's also uh, been well studied and, and well understood. But when you're talking about kind of, um, you know, a sibling side, there, there's a couple different versions of it, right? Uh, one is kind of violent, the other is sort of nonviolent, right? Um, and, you know, you talk about um, scramble competition versus interference uh, a competition, but you know, they're all more or less serving the same, same purpose. So could you, could you just, uh, maybe explain the, the insurance hypothesis, uh, uh, a little, little more, um, I mean, cause I think there's, there's an alter there's one, you talk about the, the sharks inside the womb of the, of the, the mother shark. That was pretty, uh, pretty spectacularly gruesome, right? <laughs> you know, and then you talk about the wasps in, inside the caterpillar and, you know, that's also yeah. can be similarly uh, gruesome, 
but but then there's you know these more milder forms where it's just hey I, i'm taller and i'm going to wind up getting the boluses uh or yeah. they called boli <laughs> then, uh, i'm gonna get i'm gonna do a better job of of out competing you when it comes when it comes feeding time that's true whether you're beaten to death or starved to death you're just as dead and your your lifetime reproductive success will be zero regardless of of why you died <clears throat> i define simplicide uh which i am credited with having invented the word but i did not but uh i popularized it and i i uh, i define it as something that involves significant amounts of overt aggression mm -hmm. so as opposed to just the jostling or getting position for the next uh, lump of food or out out um consuming your rivals uh that are sharing a limited budget uh i i'm perfectly happy with david lack's term brood reduction mm -hmm. and just think of simplicide as a subset of brood reduction but i don't want to get uh, there was a happy moment when I awakened, uh, oh, I don't know, 25 years ago, I was listening to national public radio, and I happened to become awake enough to hear them say uh, new words introduced into, accepted into the Oxford English Dictionary today, uh, uh, scuzzy, grunge, and sibilicide. <laughs> and I thought, yes. You've made it. <laughs> and, uh, and with scuzzy and grunge. <laughs> you know, right. but it was it was very nice. So um yeah, so those are those are just terms. Uh I think I think the where there's overt aggression, it's a little more spectacular, it's a little more, you know, gruesome, intelligenic, uh, a little more shocking, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But if uh, you know, if I'm taller than my nest mate and I simply reach up and take the food out of the parents' bill and uh, junior here never gets anything to eat uh the result is exactly the same mm -hmm. so it's it's not it's not a terribly important now you asked about the insurance hypothesis and let me back up slightly and say this is addressing what is really a life history question of how many eggs to lay and uh, uh scott forbes and i uh spent some time trying to lay out a framework uh by which uh, we could understand why parents overproduce uh, something Scott called the optimistic clutch size, the more eggs than you normally can afford to raise. And we saw on um, the uh, backup quarterback idea uh, of having an insurance uh, egg there. So the problem is if you if you lay an egg and then you incubate it for a couple, three weeks, four weeks, and then you realize you don't have enough eggs, it's you're too late. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you can't work on that family and go back and start another egg because then these are, guys are going to be four weeks old before this one's even hatching. And so you've got, you've got essentially a re-nesting exercise, a separate cycle. So uh, erring on the side of too many is the only realistic way to go. And then the incentives that parents get for doing that, one possibility that was suggested, and I've heard called the super chick hypothesis, uh, the idea was that you lay extra eggs, and if one turns out to be intrinsically superior, has better genes, and is just a you know a LeBron James uh, type of specimen, even if it's the younger one, it's going to beat up the older siblings and take over, and the parents win because they get this this uh, superstar um, as their offspring. Uh, that idea. Uh, we showed mathematically it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that's that's so, the bo that's like the boxing match. So in the book, you you just say that's you right. know, in humans when we pay to you know we pay for boxing matches, we we pay the most for the ones that are you know close the most evenly matched ones. And that's and, right. And and these these birds are basically rigging it so they 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 make it sure that one has a distinct advantage o over the other one. So they're not. They're not yeah. actually kind of letting the, the strongest survive. It's they, they already know which That's one right. they want to win this, this battle. They're specifically handicapping the one that is laid last mm -hmm. and incubated after the others already have a head start. So they've they've chosen what I call a designated victim. Mm -hmm. Or the it's the runt in the litter, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's the expendable one in which least has been invested. And if it dies, kill damage. 
uh, it's over. Well, it's kind of like but, the spare. It's kind of like the spare tire you have in your trunk, right? It's not. That's right. It's not quite as. It's you know. It's not. You don't really want to use it, but you'll use it if you have to. And the auto manufacturers are putting less and less into those spare tires. So I like that. I like that example uh, very much. That's it. I, I'll steal there. But um, so you you the the big reason that LAC was interested in for overproduction was simply the fact that it could be a good food year mm -hmm. or it could be that all the eggs will be affordable. We can afford to raise them all to independence. And that way we will have more you know, viable lottery tickets to go out and fend for themselves after mm -hmm. we stop investing in them and a better chance that several of them will survive and become reproductives and produce grandchildren. So that's the, the resource tracking hypothesis it's called that by producing an extra one, you are able to capitalize on a high food year when that turns out to be the reality. The, the insurance hypothesis is the other one that, uh, that I think is highly valid, that uh, even if it isn't a good food year, sometimes uh, you know something's gonna happen, an accident or a, mm -hmm. uh, what I call a drive-by predator may come by and just grab somebody out of the mess and take off with it. And having a backup then, uh, uh, pays insurance value. And the third possibility uh, that you would have a, a super chick, I think that's the least attractive of the arguments because if you're, if you're creating this asynchronous hatch, you know, and if the, the ones with the superior genes are assigned randomly, mm -hmm. then you're going to be handicapping the super chick uh, as often as you're, as you're helping it get through. So that, that seems like a counterproductive move. You wouldn't, if you're really trying, if you want the best of N, then you want them to be as a level of playing field as possible and let the, you know, may the, may the best chick win. But uh, handicapping them overtly is a step in the wrong direction for that hypothesis. Well, of course, another thing you talk about is not just competition among, uh, I mean, not just, um, what happens in a single generation, but there's this sort of intertemporal trade-off, right? So that the, the parent um, birds, if they overinvest in a single period, it's going to impair their productivity kind of in, in future years. So what, what, what I found yeah. interesting about this is that this, this required you to spend uh, a couple years <laughs> right, uh, observing them, right? And, and previous to your research, um, I think the researchers didn't really have the ability to kind of see what the impact was uh, in, in future years of, um, you know, any kind of well, overfeeding in, or overproduction in, in a single year, right? My system was not good for that. Um, the egrets, uh, uh, they nest in dense colonies. Uh, if, you, if you develop a trap that works to grab the bird nesting there, you're disturbing several thousand others. And so you, the colony would desert. So Getting the parents uh, individually marked was not, it was a luxury that I could not have with my animals. Now there's a guy at the University of Mexico in Mexico City, Hugh Drummond, who's studying boobies, which are seabirds out on isolated rocks out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And those birds being seabirds and being from isolated areas, they're remarkably docile and tolerant of humans. So he's had his population, and also they come back you can't nest in the middle of the ocean. You have to come back to the rock. And so he can find the same birds generation after generation, year after year. And if, if I'd had guaranteed a guarantee of 30 years of funding success of uh, uh, funding levels from the national science foundation, I would have started thinking about this uh, much more seriously, but that's not the way it works in this country. And, um, and there was no guarantee that the herons and egrets were going to come back to the colony where I'd been watching the, the last year. So that just seemed like a, a long, long, long shot. But with, with seabirds, that is being worked out, and he is getting some very interesting results about the long-term effects. But basically, the idea is these are long-lived birds. Uh, herons and egrets may live 20, 30 years. And so they aren't going to be working at their maximum, at their physiological uh, limits, they're pacing themselves for a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so they they um, probably have a finite amount of parental costs that they're willing to sustain in a given reproductive cycle. And beyond that, uh, 
if it means that somebody out of this year's brood uh, has to die, so be it. But I'll be around next year and for 19 years thereafter. So um, that seems to be the, the primary uh, reason as to why. So the parents are not working as hard as they could. And sometimes with birds, when you're trying to do one thing, you stumble across something else ser serendipitously. And one of the things that we found in certain experimental manipulations that I've tried in the field, you find that the parents are actually perfectly capable of bringing more food, which kind of answers the question of that demonstrates that they could be doing more and they're choosing not to, getting back to your question of choices. So they're, they're pacing themselves. Well, I think it's impossible to talk about um, mm -hmm. you know, family dynamics without mentioning the uh, influence of Robert Trivers, right? And so, you know, you, 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 no, sure. you talk in the book about what a, um, what a kind of bombshell it was when, when Trivers first showed up on the scene with, with his, um, his, his model of interfamily conflict. Um, and you said it was, you know, super elegant and there was maybe a little bit of resistance at first, but ultimately everyone kind of came over to the, the Trivers uh, point of view. And, and yet you find uh, that there's, you know, there's far more nuance to, to the, to the model. And, um, and, and the area that I found particularly interesting was this idea of, of, of communications, right. And how, the offspring would presumably try to dupe their their parents into providing them with uh, benefits that um, they maybe didn't even need. So could, could you talk a bit about that, um, right, the kind of uh, arms race between communication and trying to de decode the communication between offspring and, and parent? Okay, let me, let me, let me, um, Scoop my story here slightly by saying that I was a, a early and very enthusiastic convert to his theory. He calls it parent offspring conflict. Um, and I'll define what that is in a moment for your listeners. But <clears throat> I was a strong convert to it, and now I'm a heretic. So the longer I, the longer I stared at it, the more mm -hmm. I think, no, this is one of those sexy ideas that people developed a big, big bandwagon about. And I think it's it's more flash than substance. Well, I mean, well, I mean, I think any parent who is exposed to Trevor's theory is immediately going to recognize, right? You know, exactly. you got your kids exactly. throwing tantrums and and just you know they're the most Machiavellian things out there, right? They they know how to jerk their parents around to get the iPad and you know to get the extra cookie and and everything else, right? No, it was it was brilliant marketing here. His his argument, and he used tantrums as a centerpiece of his argument. And uh, everybody who has ever been a parent fell in love with the, the theory immediately. And everyone who's ever been a child, which is all of us, um, was um, uh, attracted to the idea that the kids would have some power and so forth. But let me go back and recap the basic idea, which is that as a parent, I am symmetrically related to all of my offspring coefficient of relatedness of 0.5, I'm donating half of the DNA that goes into that son and half of the DNA that goes into that daughter. Therefore, ceteris paribus, I am equally interested in both of my offspring if all you look at is the degree of relatedness. Um, and yet, from the point of view of siblings, the individual son, uh, I made them gender different so that I can be clear about them. The son is going to look at himself and say, I'm 100% related to myself and my sister is only 50% related to me. Therefore, I would prefer to be selfish and to uh, consume more than half of, more than my share of the parental investment. Lovely, lovely argument, lovely model, makes perfectly good sense. If all that anybody is looking at are these genetic relatedness, I have no problem with the argument whatsoever. But now if we go back to David Lack and start thinking about uncertainty and start thinking about those sort of messy variables in economics and evolutionary biology, then you realize that that's not the only, parents may very well prefer one offspring over another for a variety of reasons, uh, including, um, well, just a whole, whole variety of reasons, my assessment of which one seems to be uh, uh, the stronger bet for producing grandchildren or 
what the family budget is like or whether I've already put the daughter into a competitive hole by hatching her late or whether I gave the son extra hormones to make him dominant. Uh, and I'm not playing the gender there uh, intentionally. But there are other factors going on. But when Trivers came out with his idea, and I was, I happened to be literally in the audience at the, I think it was a AAAS meeting in Washington, D.C. in 1972, when Trivers gave the oral version of, of the paper that came to Paradox from Conflict. And I heard him give it, and I just thought, that's brilliant, that's marvelous, that explains everything, blah, blah, blah. I fell completely in love. And then it took several more years of fooling around with with these egrets and thinking the interplay between theory and data that I sort of fell out of, out of love with it. But here I also became sort of increasingly cynical about the way that um, biologists are as subject to confirmation bias as all other hominids. And so we, if you fall too far in love with an idea, you start looking for evidence that supports that idea rather than what Karl Popper was talking about, which was that you should be actually looking as hard as you can for any evidence that might falsify it. And Einstein wrote or said, um, uh, a thousand experiments cannot prove me right, but one experiment can prove me wrong. And that's a powerful insight, very powerful insight. And it's the way scientists pretend we act and at our best, it is the way we act, but we're not always at our best. So I, I became sort of jaded uh, at various ways with various ideas uh, in my field where some, some hot idea came along, everybody got excited. There was kind of a, a rat race to be the first one to go out and collect data supporting the sexy idea, because then you can publish in Science and Nature and in some other prestigious journal. But if you go out and actually test it and find out that the, that the emperor has no clothes, then you have trouble getting your paper published because everybody is rooting for the sexy hypothesis. And so there's, like a, there's a sociology of science that goes into this. And, um, you know, the way that the academic career is structured, you are rewarded for getting grants and you get grants that you're rewarded if you're publishing in science and nature and for putting out lots of papers. And so the easiest way to get published is to support the sexy hypothesis. Uh, the more productive way in terms of the overall collective human enterprise of science is to go out and try to falsify hypotheses. And so um, we're not always at our best and um, some of us, you know, we'll never be elected prom queen because we keep pointing out the, the, the corners that were cut along the way. And I think, I think parent offspring conflict is a great example of that, of where, um, people wanted to believe that it was terribly important. And once I became really, um, insufferably resistant to it, I suppose is fair to say. Then and really started looking for has anybody actually published a study that has me convinced? I found about three cases, and there are like hundreds of cases where people have cited it as this explains why my animals do what they do. <clears throat> but almost almost none of those cases have they actually eliminated simpler explanations for it. Well, look, I mean, everyone in evolution understands the. Um, sexual selection, right? And it's it's a it, it is a sexy uh, right uh, area, and it's it's super interesting and, and yep. fascinating, and and so it, it would seem to make sense if there was something like progeny selection, right, where um, the offspring would compete on some variable, right, and uh, mm -hmm. and 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 then that variable kind of kind of takes off, right, and and. Um, this is sometimes, you know, I think your, your example of the cuckoos, I, I mean, you cannot talk about, you know, um, uh, nursery issues without talking about, about cuckoos, right? But in, in the example of, of the cuckoos, right, there's this um, supernormal stimulus at work. Uh, and this seems to be something similar to what we might think of as, as, as sexual selection. There's some 
okay. some signal and then um you know that that signal just kind of goes haywire and the eggs just get bigger and bigger and bigger and and so the 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 parents um nurse it even though it's not even their own offspring right so is this idea of, of progeny selection something that has legs has has there been more research into this um can um, you think of other examples yeah, we, that have been scott forbes and i published a paper uh we called it progeny choice but it was the it was the parallel of mate choice in sexual selection so where you look at your offspring and you shower particular favoritism on some so parental favoritism um mm-hmm. it, that's exactly what is not predicted by Trevor's theory of parent offspring conflict where the parent is only supposed to be taking into consideration genetic relatedness which is symmetrical but uh, there are other factors and you may well show favoritism uh, lots of parents abandon uh, an offspring that is not developing very well for example my favorite example of this is the uh, the navel orange tree where somebody actually counted and showed that a, a typical navel orange tree has 200,000 blossoms, more or less. And then uh, after some of the blossoms never get fertilized, so they are potential offspring that never become embryos. And then- It's like spontaneous all, abortion in trees, right? You have spontaneous abortion and all the ones that are on the shady side of the tree or where the fertilizer isn't good or where the, the roots aren't bringing up enough water or any number of things, uh, offspring on that side of the tree are n- do not develop as well, do not give signals back to the parent that I'm healthy and strong, and the parents abort them, and they just drop them, upsize them, and just let gravity remove the mess. And uh, at the end of the whole uh, season, uh, a navel orange tree that started with 200,000 blossoms uh, uh, yields an average of 618 uh, oranges. So you've gone from 200,000 to 618. That's a 99% cull that has gone on. And the ones that were damaged by insects are dropped. The ones that are impoverished in any way are dropped by the parents. So there is, there is progeny choice going on, and it's, it's very much like mate choice. <clears throat> but they're not handicapping certain individuals that from the get-go. They start them all on all branches, and then you wait and just let the chips fall where they may. But this involves some kind of credible signal, right? So there has to be a credible signal of underlying need or of underlying uh, fitness potential, right, in order to give the, the parent the ability to discriminate, right? And it could be something as simple as the, the fruits that are sucking resources out of the parent are taking photosynthate. Uh, at a a healthy high level and are sucking water out of the xylem at a healthy high level, those offspring are indicating that they are viable. I, I don't I don't have any idea of the plant physiology behind how the signal is actually conveyed. There may be hormones involved. <clears throat> I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Well, so when in all of your descriptions of your research, it seems like there's a lot of drudgery, right? There's a lot of tedium, right? You spend a lot of time in these blinds, you know, watching birds yes. and, and waiting for things to happen. And you say that, you know, exhilaration is, is a relatively rare thing in the life of an empirical um, um, biologist. Yes. Um, how has it changed since you've written this book? I mean, uh, I would expect that with all of the cheap cameras and sensors and, and all of the tools that are available oh. for field work, has, has, has it gotten easier oh. for you to kind of test hypotheses is, has, the, has the world become a little bit less uh, tedious yeah. um, than it used to be well and you can you can get into systems that you couldn't get into before so now for example I'm studying eastern bluebirds and I take mm-hmm. I happen to have one right here a GoPro camera this slides into the top of the nest box camera looks down on the brood babies have little tiny paint marks mm-hmm. on their heads and I can tell which chick gets the worm. And I, I can uh, look at the videotapes and see. Now, this was a system I could not possibly have studied unless I could you know, get a bottle of drink me and shrink down to that size and sit up in the, in the attic of a 
bluebird nest box, but I can put, you know, five of these cameras out in five different nest boxes and go home and have coffee. Uh, so the, the technology, needless to say, this device was not developed for field biologists. This was developed so that your kids can bungee jump off of a, of a tall bridge mm -hmm. and document their suicide in, in high res. Uh, and people will buy these for that reason. But biologists are perfectly happy to steal theories from economics or gadgets from uh, uh, other markets. And there's just marvelous technologies that are out there, radio telemetry. And now they've got devices that are weigh almost nothing and that you can put onto a, a, a purple martin and in Canada. And next year, when that purple martin comes back, you can catch the bird, take the little chip off of it that you left, and it will tell you what time it got light and dark every day uh, for the whole year uh, in between. And that information of when the sun rises and when the sun sets can be used to find within 10 miles where the bird was every minute of its migration to South America and back. Unimaginable. Uh, you know, when I was a graduate student, um, you know, you could only dream of such things. And then people were trying to do things like following birds in ultralight aircraft and other things. Well, we're not flying ourselves around and we're not shrieking ourselves down to get into nest boxes because technology can now do some of those things. And the biggest technological leap of all that has happened in evolutionary biology has been uh, uh, relatedness. Uh, the, the DNA uh, assays of finding out who is related to whom, and in particular, uh, where the male gametes are ending up in the population, because otherwise, um, the old saying was, mama's baby, papa's maybe. Uh, nobody was really quite sure uh, who the father was of all of these, of uh, all of these uh, nestling birds. <clears throat> and one of the, one of the, it's never been published because the student uh, abandoned graduate school, but she, she got a result and showed that in cattle egrets, one of the birds that I was studying psilocybin, in, it is in fact the, the victim chick actually is significantly more likely to have been fertilized by someone other than the resident male. So in that sense, it comes back around again and thinks, oh, that makes it even easier to understand uh, as to why uh, fatal sibling competition would be favored by natural selection if you're really getting rid of somebody who's not a half full glass, but only a quarter full. Now, towards the end of the book, you say that, um, you know, there's, there's something wonderful about being wrong. And, um, you know, it's a little counterintuitive, right? Because yeah. none of us like to be wrong, right? Being wrong is, is painful. Re being wrong is something that uh, we're failing in general is, is painful. And in Silicon Valley, we, we talk about, you know, fail often and, and, and fail fast. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, if, if you make it cheap and easy to fail, then you can fail more often. But in, in the world of research, right, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to be wrong with a great deal of frequency. I mean, if you're wrong with your dissertation, like it's over, I mean, you know, you only get so many bites at the apple. Is it getting, you know, is, is it getting easier to be wrong? Is it getting easier to, to kind of um, have more experiments? Is science becoming um, better at accepting being wrong? And, and is this idea of, you know, just doubling down and thinking harder, something that's, that's, that's um, becoming more common I wish, uh, because it's easier to run run experiments. I wish it were. Um, I, I I I don't know is the honest answer to your question. I would like to think so. The advantage of being wrong, to me, is that it it tells you that there's one or more variables that you haven't been thinking through properly. And when you're right, you you think you pat yourself on the back and you say, "Okay, that's wonderful. I must have understood everything perfectly." When you get answers that are exactly the opposite of what you expect, then you realize, oh, I messed up. And that means that the entire literature that I have read in preparing this prediction also is missing something, which means I have an opportunity to find out something subtle and interesting and that everybody else has missed. So it's, it's actually good to be wrong. And uh, I'm, let me just grab a fifth here behind you. I will plug this book, mm -hmm. Stuart, what's his name? 
Firestein, Stuart Firestein book mm -hmm. called Ignorance, How It Drives Science. And I'm a big fan of this book because he's making essentially that, that point very nicely that, uh, that when, when science is wrong, then you think harder about the problem. And I think in the book, I put this old joke that I got out of Boy's Life magazine of why are your car keys always the last mm -hmm. place you look? And the punchline is because you stop looking. So when science gets the answer that it expects, it stops thinking. And that, you know, on its face is probably not great strategy. Uh, you should not stop thinking. Uh, you should uh, keep digging a little farther into it. So when we're... Um when we're mentoring graduate students, should, should we encourage them to, to, to kind of um, seek out, um, seek out the boundaries, seek out kind of, you know, where they can be wrong, figure out like, um, you know, just keep exploring until they get to the place where they, they realize what their own ignorance is and the limits of their model. Interesting question. Um, the problem there is that you've got, you're constrained as a PhD student that you have to have a dissertation you know, within a certain time limit. Um, I'm not sure that this particular insight is one that you can pursue productively during the course of a PhD career. And it certainly wasn't anything I figured out while I was a pre-doctoral student. But um, <clears throat> later, when you have a little more freedom to be wrong and uh, a little you know, more highly cultivated critical thinking skills, then you start to appreciate the value uh, that comes from being wrong. And, um, and you start becoming uh, less patient with people who always seem to find the, the exact uh, answer that they were expecting. They get up and introduce their, their talk with all these elegant reasons for expecting the wind to blow west and then they demonstrate that the wind always blows west, and then they sit down and they're happy. And um, my world certainly never works that way. Uh, and I, I find that things go completely fouled up uh, way much of the time, and it, it pays to try to think through why that would be and what was I missing when I made that prediction, and why is the wind blowing east some of the time and not, not uh, always west? Well, Doug, thanks so much for joining me. This book was uh, was really was really a fun read, uh, and we didn't touch on all the different topics. We never got into bees. <laughs> we never got into to, to beans and, and pods, and uh, there's so much more in here, um, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So thanks so much. More Than Kin and Less Than Kind, Doug Mock. You, do you know the derivation of that title? It's Shakespeare, is it not? It's Hamlet's first yeah. line. That's right. He's talking about... A little more than kin and less than kind. Yeah, well, it makes it's uh, it's <laughs> hey, you know, um, we could just assign Hamlet as uh, as a textbook <laughs> in evolutionary biology. <laughs> see how far we get. Thanks so much, Doug. Appreciate it. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.